Um, so my talk's going to be very different to Emily's because I am only, I think, a year and a half into my PhD. So a lot more of mine is going to be more where I want to go, where I, roughly where I've done, but mainly more where I want to go. So my main research is looking at bio, bio-based, bioplastic and their degradation pathways here at Murdoch, but I've also got an industry partner with CSIRO and then another industry with EcoSAR. We'll all come together to hopefully do this. Um, so a bit about me, because I needed to talk some slides. Um, I did my master's of chemistry in the UK at the University of East Anglia. In the UK, you can do your undergrad as a master's, so that's what I did. I did my third year of university over in Australia at the University of Wollongong in New South Wales. Um, for my master's project and the research project, I look at I looked at the formation and quantification of microplastics from tea bags, which I know is very British. Um, and we got, as a research group, we got filmed and we participated in the BBC One show, The War on Plastic. So you can see my hands on TV, <laughs> chat about the research. And then also COVID struck at the end of my master's project. So I was planning to come over here and start work here, but then they sent me off to North Wales and Bangor because I couldn't get into this country. So I spent 18 months in Bangor. Um, working with their microplastics team, but also predominantly learning about radio label plastics, which I'll talk about later. Um, and now I'm in Murdoch, because I got here. And, <laughs> sorry. Um, I've been here for about a year and a half, and when I first started, I was going down one direction, but since I've been here, I had switched up. So it, it's a constant changing pattern for my PhD, but I'm interested to see where it goes and everything that I do. Um, so biodegradable, bio-based plastics, Everyone has like a different idea of what biodegradable means and what bio-based means. So these are some common plastics I've got on the board. And bio, I label bioplastics, and most people label bioplastics as plastics derived from bio, a biological substance rather than from petroleum. So the ones that are circled are all bioplastics because they're from a bioproduct. But then in them, you have biodegradable ones that are slightly different. So biodegradable ones in Australia means they have to meet the standard of it has to be 90% biodegradable over 180 days, or 90% of it has to be biodegraded over 180 days, sorry. They have to have a non-toxic effect um, resulting in compost and plants and earthworms. And then also the plastic material should contain more than 50% volatilized, volatile solids, so stuff that can turn back into CO2 or water. So your organic materials such as starch. As you can see from my cross section, we have bioplastics that are circled and biodegradable plastics that are circled. So the bioplastics are the top one and the biodegradable ones at the bottom. You can see that some bioplastics are not biodegradable and some biodegradable plastics are not bio-based plastics, if that makes sense. So this is where we have that issue of some people label everything as biodegradable because they're from a bio source, but they don't actually, once they're in the soil or in the environment, actually degrade down back into CO2 or water. Or you have the other side where it is, it does degrade, but it's not from a bio-based source, it's from um, petroleum, petroleum or oil-based source. So like your PPL and your PVAT. So they biodegrade because in a soil environment, they break down, but they don't actually they're not from a bio-based source, so they're not really a sustainable source to start with. But there is also a caveat in the ones that are biodegradable, and it's a new and emerging thing that's coming out in Australia because the, the literature and the science of that is getting more well-known, the understanding of it is being transferred better, is that being classed as biodegradable does not mean it always goes to CO2 and water. Some biodegradable things will fragment and then just make microplastics and then be a legacy plastic that's in the soil or in the oceans. Most people have heard of them, but yes. So some of the ones that are labeled biodegradable bioplastics, such as PLA, here in Australia are used a lot for our single-use plastics, I know, but they will be in the future taken out of legislation because they are the ones that fragment, they don't degrade fully to CO2 and water. So they're just producing more and more microplastics. Yeah, so my PhD, I'm predominantly going to be focusing on the ones in this circle, but with a particular focus on PHA, because where we're standing, it's the bio-based bioplastic that is the, the golden one, because it does degrade into water and CO2. So in plastic, there's not just the polymer, there's also plastic additives. So plastic additives are chemical compounds that are added to the polymer to alter the properties and function of the plastic. So if we take that, there can be multiple different 
plastic additives, like up to 15, I found in some of the literature, can be added to one plastic product to change all the, um, sorry, to change the properties of the plastic. And then also multiple of one type of additive can be used to different compounds that have the same effect. So if you take plastic lids and plastic bags, both are polyethylene, but they all have different strengths. They all have different flexibilities and they all have different colours, as the nice pictures say, all because of plastic additives. So because that, the plastic additives are incorporated into the matrix when you're making the polymer, predominantly on the production line, but that means they're not combat, like connected to the, to the polymer itself. That means they can migrate easily from the plastic into the environment adding another layer of toxicity to wherever the plastic ends up. Um, and their degradation isn't really taken into account in literature, it's more focused on the plastics itself or plastics as a whole. So you see the plastics degrading, but you don't really see the focus on what additives there are in the plastics. You're mainly just focusing on the plastic. Oh, it's not there anymore. And most people, it's out of sight, it's out of mind. So we're looking at the microplastics and also plastic additives, so the things you don't really see. So, degradation pathways of plastics. There are the ones that I'm probably going to look at is land, there's water, there's compost, and then there's also insects. So, in land, that means it's exposed to like natural weathering, um, so that's wind, sunlight, but then also to the microbial community and soil. You typically get this when just like littered or it goes into landfill. Um, we have water, which is more like oceans and lakes and rivers. This is predominantly degraded through UV, um, sorry, UV radiation and then a mechanical abrasion. So the constant turning of the waves or the movement of the current is moving around, weakening the plastic and then degrading it. Composting is basically like the home compost. You put your um, food in there and it degrades down into a nice soil, soil mulch. We're hoping that plastic plastics that we have can be put into your home compost and take advantage of that high microbial community to then degrade the plastic faster. So it's predominantly focused on the, the activity of the microbial community in that region. And then insects, there is a new and emerging species like mealworms, and I can't remember the other one. <laughs> oh, it's like wax moths. Oh, I've got it on the board. <laughs> so mealworms and wax moths have been reported to consume plastics but there is still new and emerging. So we don't know whether they're being consumed and just like passed through, so just breaking up or consumed and actually taken in by the insect and used as a food source. So what I'm predominantly focusing on is land and the terrestrial environment and then compost because they can be linked quite easily. Water and insects are a bit out of my scope because I've only got four years. <laughs> I wish I could do it all, but I can't. Um, so what we've got planned and what I helped out in Bangor when I was there is setting up a field trial. So we're going to look at both the degradation above and below ground. So above ground, the bioplastics will be exposed to natural weathering, such as wind, rain and sunlight or UV exposure. And then that can be compared to other plastics with the other plastic polymers and how they break down. They have exposed them. Um, and then we're going to measure the aggregation through FTIR. And as you can see from this paper, that's not mine. Um, as they are exposed to UV light, especially the degradation has started to occur because the peaks in the, um, in the FTIR has started to decrease. So they're just getting slightly weaker. And then we're also going to look at the low ground. So we're, or what I'm doing is currently cutting out loads and loads of plastic films to help bury them into the ground about 10 feet below. Attach a lollipop stick so I can find them later. Um, and so we're gonna put them in mesh bags and then over the course of a year again, we're gonna sample them and then determine their degradation rate, monitoring through FDIR, but also hoping to use GCMS um, and other cool techniques. And um, so that's the mesh bag approach is that, so you have, I've got two different mesh sizes. So you have one mesh size, then you have soil layer, then you have your plastic film that you're worrying, watching another soil layer and another mesh bag, all sandwiched together, tied to a lollipop stick, buried underground. And then with that, I'm gonna move on to also looking at radio labeled bioplastics. So when I was in Bangor, they had a radio like radiation lab that they 
but nice enough to train me in. And then now here, I've recently been certified to handle radiological materials. So we're setting up a radiation lab here at Murdoch. And so what we can do with this is use 14C as a, um, 14C is an isotope of carbon. And we can use that as like a tracer to watch where the polymer or the additive in its, in my case, degrades by using it as like a little flag, if that makes sense. So if you capture the 14CO2 CO2 that comes off, you know exactly where that's come from because it can only come from your carbon, the 14C carbon source that you popped in at the beginning. So we can incorporate the 14C isotopes either by putting in additives, so putting, making a polymer, um, making something that I made films, so making films with a polymer and then adding the additives in that and then casting the films, or we're going to try and put it onto the polymer chain. Um, so with the polymer chain, it allows 14C source to be used in, in the polymer chain reaction, so we know exactly where it would be on in the, in the polymer when it comes. And then we're going to hopefully make CHA bonds with 14C um, on the polymer. Sorry, it says polymer a lot. Um, which then allows us to monitor the degradation of the polymer itself. So we avoid that, is it fragmenting, is it degrading kind of battle. We know if we're getting 14C CO2, we know it's definitely the polymer that we're going for the 14C CO2. So it's degrading all the way and it's not just fragmenting. With the plastic additive, this helps us determine the relationship between the polymer and the plastic additive. So we use 14C plastic additives. Um, we can incorporate them between the polymer and the, um, so yeah, like I said, the interaction between the polymer and the additive can be monitored. Um, and then we can also monitor the degradation of plastic, like the additive itself from the polymer into the like, soil in my case, and then also how far it goes and how long it takes. Because a lot of what's out there in the literature is degradation rates of additives is monitored by whether it's there or not. So they take soil, they extract the polymer, or they extract the additive that they're looking for, and they say yes, it's there or not. But the additive doesn't degrade fully from one thing to then straight to CO2 and water. It has multiple steps in the way. So what most of that literature is just looking at is whether the starting additive is there and not whether there are many multiple different little steps along the way is there in its degradation. So with the 14C CO2 method, we know it's stuck, what adjective we popped in and the fact it's gone all the way to the end of its degradation pathway to form CO2. Hope that makes sense. So I looked in my research at phthalate acid esters, um, which are type of plasticizers. They can be, they're low cost, low volatile, and they have an elastic nature. So they're really handy to use as plasticizers. And in the films, especially in mulch films, um, they can be made up to 70% of the weight of the film. But however, these additives are known to be toxic and hazardous. So understanding their interaction between the film and the soil is key. So this is my proposed degradation pathway. So what we, I was saying again, how we started with the additive have multiple steps all the way down to get to CO2 and water at the end. Um, and then in my experiment, we used 14C radio labeled. We knew the radio carbon was on the benzene ring, which is now highlighted in my mechanism. Um, and we used two, we looked at two different additives. We looked at well, two different phthalate, phthalate acid esters, sorry. And we looked at di 2 ethyl hexyl phthalate, CEHP, and we looked at dab ethyl phthalate, EBP. So that means we show if CO2 was detected, we know it's complete degradation because 14 cco 2 could only come from that ring opening in the last step of the mechanism. And we did this, captured the mineralized stuff in lovely tubes and captured it in sodium hydroxide traps. So the results of this is we managed to make films. That's the first success. We actually managed to make radio label plastic films. Um, we compared a film versus a solution to check that, to monitor the, how the polymer itself acts in the degradation pathway. So we found that the polymer hinders degradations because the DEHP and the DDP were reluctant to migrate from the film. And that can be shown from the lag time. And then because of that, we hypothesized, I guess. Um, that the polymer acts as a shield and it hinders degradation. Um, we also predicted that the concentration, therefore, of PAEs in soil or in agricultural soil 
um, is higher than predicted because as long as then the plastic's around, the averages can still be around because it is protected. We also did UV exposure and we used biosolids to help accelerate the degradation. And as you can see on the left hand side is UV exposure. The top line is the UV exposed and the bottom line is covered. And then the right one is the biosolids and the line that goes up is the, the addition of biosolids to the soil. So both of them show that they do accelerate degradation of the, the additive. And then you can read about this if you're more interested in my first published journal. Um, it was published in the Journal of Hazardous Material earlier this year. So where I would like to go forward from this is to go on and get that polymer chain labelled. So we can do this, with, this is key because then we can look at compost soil and in soils to see how they change like the microbial community of the two, how different they are and the different scales. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, I've lost like my train of thought completely. <laughs> um, so it's key to get that polymer chain labelled because then we can monitor in both in soils and in compost how the different rates of degradation changes from them and it's key in trying to relate that back to the environment so trying to either get that into home compostable or to get that to understand how especially in agricultural soils, a lot of films and agricultural plastics are just buried in because it's a lot easier than it is to remove the plastics from the ground. So understanding that relationship, is it faster in compostable soils or is it faster in like agricultural soils? That would be key to understanding what's best to do for the films, especially agricultural films. And then 14C labelled, I keep, keep talking about, <laughs> um, would assess the degradation um, Will help determine that degradation rate but also in that we don't it's not just degradation that we can monitor we can also take out the it could also form microplastics and we can monitor where these plastics go the degradation is not a fast thing it will take many months for it to happen so if it does fragment into microplastics we can extract that and see where they're going along their journey and what points they're at so in that sense we can look at how toxicity and soil fauna come into play so plastics can be consumed by the additives and where we can see the bag is eating plastics. And then we can see with 14 layers of plastics, we can trace the plastic parts into, into the bug and see if whether it's excreted or if it has a nutritional value. Um, and there's enormous potential in this part of segregation pathways in like dealing with the world's plastic problem. But the mechanism of that and how it undergoes is very, it's emerging, it's very new. It's still, there's a lot of people looking into it. So I do think that's really key, but it's gonna be someone else on my plastics project story.